Thank you for letting me do this, Joe. This is terrific. I, I enjoy doing these things. I don't have time to do them like I, like I have in the past. I am overwhelmed with uh, two or three things in my life. One of those things, and I, I got I to gotta put this out there for 30 seconds, I run the Georgia Prevention Project. We are a opioid and heroin prevention organization for Georgia statewide. We started as the Georgia Meth Project several years ago, and we expanded to opioids and heroin. It is an epidemic in our state. It is an epidemic even worse in some other states. We have about almost 30 overdose deaths a week in Georgia from this problem, 1,450 a year and going up at 20% a year. So I just put it out there to tell you, you know, watch out for these, these things that doctors are prescribing. We're trying to get the doctors to stop prescribing so many of these opioids, these hydrocodones and Percocets and all these things. They are heroin, just in a different name and form, but they're the same thing. So just watch it, just watch out. And number one overdose death day is Thanksgiving Day. Because people go visit grandma or they go home and they go in the medicine cabinet and they take some stuff out and they overdose. The number two overdose day of the year is the day after Thanksgiving. So just remember that, you know, when you're at Thanksgiving and you've got some pills in the medicine cabinet and you think, oh, nobody's going to touch those, just put them away somewhere. Okay, that's just a safety tip for you. Now, now we got that out of the way. I just had to, I had to do that as a public service an announcement because that's my work and it is a very important issue that we're working on these days. But this is what I really love to talk about. And that is this early uh, history of Northwest Georgia, early history and prehistory of Northwest Georgia. You know, I started when I was, gosh, 12, 13, 14 years old, like a lot of you in the room, walking through fields, picking up things out in the field and pieces of pottery and pieces of broken points and, you know, those kinds of things. And, and I just couldn't get enough of it. I just, it just wouldn't go away for me. And I worked, started working with some professional archaeologists at New Echota when I was 16, uh, right out there when they were building a new golf course. And I just, again, would not let it, let it go away. What we didn't understand at that time, and I, and I learned, I went all over the county, you know, my last year in high school and tore up an old car, going through every dirt road and back road you can imagine, looking for these sites. And we began to figure out uh, that, gosh, that some of this pottery, we could, we could figure out how, how it all fit together. That, that there was pottery we understood up through the kind of Etowah time period. And then things got really funny and we couldn't figure it out. And then came the Cherokees. And we couldn't figure out what was going on in between in there. You know, what, where did all these people go? Why wasn't there a logical, you know, uh, uh, occupation that went straight on through from earlier times right on through into the Cherokee and the historic time periods? It wasn't like that, but we couldn't figure out what the break was. We couldn't figure out what the problem was. Well, the problem was an apocalypse, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. It, we began to figure it out in the 1970s, somewhere in the 1970s, 1980s. We began to figure it out, and all these sites that I went and visited and all these things that I collected in high school, all of a sudden they were important. All of a sudden, they all fit, they fit this pattern of what we were looking for, of this moment before this big collapse, before this big apocalypse. So that's what we're going to talk about, is how it came to that moment, how things fell off the cliff, what happened after that, how did we get to the historic period of the Cherokees? Because these were not Cherokees who were here before. These were Muscogean-speaking people, ancestors of the Creeks. And they, by 1600, they were gone. They disappeared. So Cherokees were not here very long. Cherokees started coming in here in the 1700s after this big collapse, after this big uh, apocalyptic moment. So that's what we're going to talk about. How did that, that's why we study the 16th century. That's why it's so important to look at what the Spanish were doing because we got good records, some really good records. And we can trace backwards in time from this 16th century moment when the Spanish were here, looking at the sites that they described and the distances between these sites, we can trace backwards in time four or five hundred years to the times of the earliest times that Etowah was occupied, for example. And then we can trace forward in time from that moment when the Spanish came to understand how, where the Cherokees, how they got here, what that was all about, what these people looked like, these peoples, these occupation groups, 
these people who were here and then disappeared, what, what all happened in that whole... If we study that little snapshot, that 1500, 1540 to 1560, 1580, that whole time there in the 16th century, if we can study that really well and understand that, then lots of things make sense after that. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Kusawati River, Etowah River looks just like that, right? Uh, a lot of the time. Uh, that doesn't look like an apocalypse, does it? That's what that river looked like, you know, before the Spanish came, before uh, Europeans came, and that's what it looks like today. You know, that was in the 1980s when I took that, took that picture. Um, well, gosh, what is that? That is, uh, imagine what that is. That's from uh, Road Warrior, right? Apocalyptic moments, right? We know about apocalypses. We've seen them on TV, you know, post-apocalyptic moments. We know what that's all about because we've seen them. Uh, and we've seen The Road, if you, don't, if you saw, that, saw that movie. Gosh, what a grim movie that was, right? And grim book by Cormac McCarthy. Well, there's some things that, that are scarcities that happen during Apocalypse. So that's what we learn from those movies. Food is a, is a scarcity. That's what The Road was all about. Everybody was literally resorting to cannibalism because they were starving to death. Uh, you know, food was a big deal. Transportation. That's what all the, all the Mad Max movies are about, right? All Road Warrior. It's all about getting the gasoline to get transportation. We had to have transportation if you were going to go get some food. If you were going to, uh, you know, have some friendship or companionship. You had to gather people together because you had to, if you gathered people together in groups, then you had a better chance of surviving this terrible time. Uh, after all this breakdown of a society. So those are some things to keep in mind that we're going to talk about and we're going to see how these things play out in this time after the Spanish came and after so much, after so much changed. The time periods in the southeast. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but for those of you who have, don't know this context, I'm giving it to you now. The Paleo-Indian period, 10,000 B.C. to about 8,000 B.C. Uh, the Archaic period. After that, the Woodland period, Mississippian period. In, this, in these time periods in here, and I'm going to use what Carl Etheridge gave me tonight. And Carl, Carl presented me with this, which I really is very special. And we'll talk about these arrows later uh, in the 16th century and what deadly weapons that they were. But I love using these as, as a pointer uh, as well. But these are, these are time periods here, very long time periods of people somewhat nomadic. We don't really know a lot about their villages' systems. Uh, but we do know that they're left materials across the landscape for a long period. In the woodland period, lots of more concentration going on of these people. They're getting very good at exploiting resources around them, food resources. And then in the Mississippian period, they very heavy reliance on agriculture and very complex political systems and the building of mounds, all of those things. So when the Spanish came here in 1500, 1550, 1600, we were still in that period. The mound building was still going on. It was not quite as spectacular. The mounds were not quite as big, but the populations were huge. The populations were huge. In fact, there was a population explosion going on from about 1400, 1450 to the, when the Spanish came in, in 1540 or so. Uh, we're looking to talk about you know, just, just sites going up like a, like a rocket. And I, I call it urban sprawl. I mean, you know, you had, you had uh, Etowah, is a good example. We all know about Etowah. Big mound there, very complex, very powerful capital of a big system. Uh, well, people started living outside the walls of Etowah, started living up and down the river, across the river, up and down Pumpkin Vine Creek. So those villages just started to explode because of population. They just couldn't, they couldn't hold everybody inside the walls anymore. They ran inside the walls maybe for protection, you know, in times of war or conflict. But but they, they, there were so many people living in these places, they began to expand and, and fill in gaps up and down the rivers with lots of other villages. And this shows you how those rise of these chiefdoms, and that's what we call these things, chiefdoms. You see up there where the, that little bullseye is, that's around uh, Cahokia, uh, right up there near St. Louis, Missouri. And you can see these lines represent time periods. That's about 900 A.D., 950 A.D., that timeline there is about 1000 A.D., 1100 A.D. So you see Etowah came on the rise at about 1000 A.D. Macon Plateau also at about 1000 A.D. 1100 A.D. in this time, 
timeline here and 1,280 here. So this radiating out of these, this, these big Mississippian period, these chiefdoms. I say a chiefdom, I'm talking about a political system with lots of little villages reporting to each other, reporting up to a paramount chief. Remember that word, we'll, that phrase. We'll come back to that in a few minutes about what DeSoto encountered when he came to the southeast. He encountered a paramount chief. And you look at mound sites in that period, 1200 to 1500 AD, in Georgia. Well, you see a bunch of them in here grouped, and that's along, what do we call that? The fall line, exactly. It's where the rivers come down, they break off the Piedmont into the floodplain. The places where they break are places where there are shoals. And so that's a place where, you know, fish spawn. It's a great place to catch fish in that little area. It's also a place where those rivers dump soil, fertile soil in the springs when they flood. And so when those things flood, they dump very fertile soil. And so it was a great place to grow crops. Well, in northwest Georgia, we've got the same thing because of the fault line that is called the Great Smoky Fault that runs right over here. I mean, it's, it's right over here, uh, you know, that's where Alatoona Dam is built on a fault line. So is Carter's Dam. They're built on one of the oldest fault lines in the world. In California, we wouldn't get away with that, right? It'd be too unstable. Uh, but here, these are very, very stable fault lines. But they break right there at those lines, right there where Alatoona Dam is. It breaks out into this that's a valley. Same with Carter's Dam on the Kusawati River. They break, those rivers break that fault line, almost like a fall line in South Georgia, breaks and out here in this area where we're standing right now is one of the valleys. We're in the middle of the valley, uh, a geologic valley. And along that fault line is also where you get great minerals and resources. That's why Carter's was where it is. That's what all the mining's all about here. That's what the old iron mines were all about. Those minerals that, that occur along those along those fault lines in there. So those are important the geographic barriers. Middle Mississippian cultures, cultures in that period, the Etowah Savannah culture. So even though you had, now I, I gotta back up and show you this, you got this group of mounds there at Macon around uh, Mulgee, and then you've got the mounds around here at Etowah and up here in Northwest Georgia. Well, they, we consider them of, of the same cultural type they spoke the same languages, we think, Muscogean languages, what we would call Creek people today. So they're speaking a similar language, but they were in a constant state of war with each other. Make no mistake. And that's why very little was occupied. The Chattahoochee River was kind of a boundary, and there was very little in between in here. This was almost like a no man's land between this chiefdom up in here and the chiefdom down in here. Now, they knew a lot about each other. In DeSoto, we know that because DeSoto talks about that. Oh, they're, they're talking about those people up over, you know, that far away. Oh, they knew a lot about them, and they were in a constant state of war with those folks. We'll talk about that political organization stuff uh, in a little more detail in a few minutes. And so you get these cultures, these cult Moundville, that was another very large uh, cultural system over there, and another big chiefdom. Uh, and again, the Etowah and Savannah cultures here, and a lot of other different ones uh, that are in here. And again, DeSoto encountered these when he came through. I just put this up here to show you where the rivers are and to understand that the rivers create some boundaries, but they also create opportunities for these political units to thrive. So here's Cartersville right here, and this stretch of the Etowah River had about seven or eight villages when DeSoto came through, and probably about a similar number right before he was here, I mean before that period, uh, and we would call that a polity, a political unit. And they're about three or four miles apart, those little villages, three or four miles apart, right? Just as regular as can be, right down the river. They're all part of the same chieftain. They're all part of the same political unit. Same was true up on the Kusawati. Same was true over here, uh, just west of Rome. So we, these polities had, uh, first of all, you had a chief in every village. You had two chiefs. You had a red chief and a white chief. Well, what's that all about? White chief was power ascribed to him, meaning that chief it was a lineage that came down to him. Now, we've talked about this maybe before, it was a matrilineal society. So that means it wasn't the chief's son that became the next chief, it was the chief's sister's son. The chief's sister's niece maybe, if they didn't have a male heir, sometimes it was a niece. That was true, DeSoto encountered one of those over near Columbia, South Carolina. 
very powerful people who were well educated as they came up. They were from the from the age of you know three or four or five years old. They were trained to be a leader, right on through puberty. Uh, that we know that in, in Mexico as well from the Aztecs. Well, they had even little private schools. You know these Aztec chief families, these these royal families, where they educated their kids in speech making, a lot of different things. You know, so so you, they knew from an early age that ah that that's that's part of the chief's family. There's a little royal family. And it's the chief and his sister and his sister's kids and everybody associated with that. When you married into a family, the, the, the wife didn't move in with the husband. He moved in with her family. So in the same household was the mother, the grandmother, the children. They were all in that same house together. And the male would kind of come and go, but he spent most of his time over at his sister's house. And he was helping his sister raise her children. Same with his, uh, in his the, the woman he was married to. There was an uncle somewhere coming around to help her out in raising those children. Even in, in Native American life today, you will, hear, uh, you will hear people talk about their uncle. And the uncle had a great influence on them in their lives. It's, so it's still, it's still a very powerful part of cultural life uh, in American Indians today. Let me back up with some terminology. You will hear me say American Indian, Native American, and the word Indian. Uh, I, you know, most Native American folks uh, are fine with the word Indian as long as it's said in a respectful way. And American Indian, they're fine with that too. Jace uh, Weaver, who runs the Native American Studies Program at the University of Georgia, is Cherokee, and uh, he said, you know, I didn't know I was Native American until I went to college. You know, they told me that's what I was. You know, before that, I knew that I thought I was American Indian or Indian or Cherokee, but I, didn't ever, I never knew that about that phrase, Native American. So, so if, you, if, I, if I use that terminology, bear with me. Uh, I do a lot of work with, with American Indian tribes, uh, both out west and in the east, and they're fine with being called Indians as long as it's done in the right, in the right context, in the right way. So I may use a lot of different terminology tonight, but I wanted to get that out of the way first. So there's these rivers and studying where these rivers are is really important. Now, if you had a chief in the, remember, you had a white chief and a red chief. White chief, you were born into power. The red chief, you achieved power. It was a warrior status. And you achieved that power because you proved yourself, you know, against an enemy somewhere and over, against, over time, against multiple enemies. And so it was almost like having a, a general who's running the Pentagon uh, and when you're in a time of war, the, the white chief turned the power over to that guy because you know, he's going to run things now. We're in this little moment of war. He's going to tell everybody what to do in this moment of emergency. It's kind of the way things work. And, and now, in a polity over an entire area of a river system there, over several villages, there was another chief and another red chief. So as you moved up you know, into hierarchy, there was a chief over those seven or eight villages. Then over all of those, all of those that were here, down here, on the Kusawati, all of these that stretched all up and down for several hundred miles, there was a paramount chief, a paramount chief. And he was above every other chief and was very powerful. Uh, DeSoto encountered one of those up here uh, that we'll talk about in, in a few minutes, who was in his 30s, very impressed. That chief knew a lot about, about the stretches of his, the lands and the people that reported to him up through that hierarchy. He knew a lot about the extent of his chiefdom. It stretched all the way from about Knoxville, Tennessee to Montgomery, Alabama. That was huge, huge. Lots of reporting systems going on in there. So it was very complex systems that had developed over long periods of time. This is what those things looked like. This is Cahokia outside St. Louis. Now that doesn't look like an apocalypse, does it? That looks like a pre-apocalypse. That looks like a real thriving uh, time period. And at about 1300 AD, huge mounds, huge mounds. Monk's Mound at Cahokia, I've stood on top of that before, and you can see downtown St. Louis 20 miles away. I mean, that mound is, is huge. It's 80, 90 feet high, and it's about, you know, almost twice as tall as Mound A at, at Etowah. So it was the New York City of its day. Etowah was sort of the Atlanta of its, of its day. But these are big, big villages with big open spaces uh, in between. And, of course, there's Etowah. We know Etowah very well. This is Etowah before we cut the trees down around it uh, to, to keep those trees from from destroying part of the mound. And of course the river down there with the fish traps and all those things. So Etowah was an important, very important village. 
It was also an important village when DeSoto came through, but it wasn't the capital anymore. That capital had moved up to the Kusawati uh, sometime around 1400, 1450 AD. We'll talk about that in some more detail too. This is what those villages looked like when DeSoto came through. They're different. They don't have mounts. Right. They were not as old and they had not built up those mounds over a period of time. Again, I call it kind of urban sprawl. This is sort of the, you know, sort of the, uh, the strip shopping center type of you know, way of developing things. Up and down the rivers, lots of these villages. Some of them we've excavated and seen them. They were only occupied for 20 years because the population went up like a rocket. Then when the Spanish came through and all these diseases set in, bang, they all disappeared. So we've got some of these villages that appeared uh, up and down the rivers. And of course, the houses and the construction of those houses we know about, that's over at Etowah. There's one flaw in that construction. I know Steve knows what it is, but you know, the, uh, the, the, ha the corners are really where the doors used to be, not in the center here. Uh, they were on the corners of the houses. And these were semi-subterranean, meaning they went kind of down in the ground, so they were cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter in that semi-subterranean uh, way of manufacturing. This is one of those houses. This is from the King site over near Rome. We excavated this in the 1970s, early 1970s. This is the, the, the palisade on the outside of the village. You remember this? See that? That row of sticks of, of logs? That is a defensive work, and here's the moat around the outside, just like at Etowah. And so these, all these villages had these defensive works like that to keep people out uh, in times of war. This is one of those villages. And in the center of that was a fireplace. These were little structural places where the beds were. Again, the DeSoto Diaries talk about these little beds, these little cots, and, and they stored things under the beds just like we do, you know, pots and all kinds of things. But we do a lot of archaeology on these. Uh, this is why looting is so terrible on these sites because there's so much information in here. These houses, if you saw that before, were made out of wattle and daub, mud and sticks, okay? And if that house caught fire, which they did, on occasion, and they burned down. They burned down kind of slow, but it would bake all that stuff that was on the outside of the houses. All this material, all this hard mud uh, here like this would bake like a brick. And, and when it did, then it would cover up the, the, the floor of the house. Remember, it's semi-subterranean, so it's kind of sloping in. Well, the good news is that then this field was plowed for 100 years, but it didn't hurt this floor because that all that material was protecting that, that uh, floor and that, the rest of that house. So that if you pull it off really, really carefully, you take all that, we call it daub, you pull all that daub off with your trowels very, very carefully, then you've got a time capsule right there. That entire house is a time capsule, just, just, just like the day that house burned down, all that material. And so in archaeology, we go in there and in little, in little group, back in those days, we used one foot increments Today we would use, you know, the metric system and, you know, in say in 10 centimeter increments, something like that, you would take out this floor and then you're able to process all that material in all those little squares, run it all through the computer and bingo, you figure out, wow, on this side of the house is where they were processing all the food. Over here is where they were flint napping, where the men must have been sitting doing some flint napping. You know, back here is where they were storing grains, doing those kinds of things. So you learn all that information. So you can imagine what happens when a looter's coming in to look for just a pot. They just, they don't care about all that other stuff, all that little micro, it's like a crime scene, right down to little tiny pieces of seeds. We figured out that that house burned down in October. Now, how do we know that? The types of seeds that were being processed. Honey locust seeds. You know, honey locusts are those things with big pods on them and they get those, those spiky things on the branches. They got those pods that are kind of black looking and kind of ugly. Those things are wonderful to eat. They're sweet. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful gum. In fact, you, you, you see some of your natural foods uh, and you read the label and it'll say natural gum. Well, they're talking about honey locusts. It's honey locust pods and the gum that's in those pods. It's a wonderful substance. Well, they were processing those seeds in that house and the house burned down. So we had the little pile of seeds over in one part of the house that were burned. So they had been processing those uh, sometime fairly recently uh, when that had happened. We also discovered some skeletal uh, material on the site. And these were two individuals. And this is another, this is another 
piece of evidence about an apocalypse. Usually when people were buried, there are two things about this, but three things about this burial that show us something different, terrible happened here. First of all, two people in the same pit is not, not normal. You start to see that when you start seeing lots of people dying at the same time. Epidemics. And people are dying faster than they can bury them individually. You get two or three people dying on the same day, they'll dig a hole and put two people or three people in that, in that hole together. So that's one indication. Another indication is that they're laid out flat, straightened out. Most people were not buried that way back then. They were buried in the fetal position. That's usually the way you die if you're sick, right? You're kind of curled up in a ball, you don't feel good. And a lot of people die like that. And they didn't stretch them back out. They dug a nice little respectful hole, you know, covered them up with blankets, maybe just like they were sleeping, maybe put some food in there with them in a little pot and, and bury them that way. These individuals were stretched, were stretched out. It was kind of odd. And there's a third thing. And that was a cut on this guy's head right there. A really sharp cut. Analyze it. It was made with a metal-edged weapon. Some sort of weapon that was so sharp that it cut into the bone without bashing the skull in. So some sort of sword, some sort of hatchet-type weapon that was sharper than anything that, that Native Americans would have used. We began to analyze. This, this was in 1973. Went out on that one site out there west of Rome. Pat Garrow did it, the group from Shorter College. They were looking at some material. From that time period I was talking about that we didn't understand, he went out there, put one hole down in the ground, and came right down on this burial. All of a sudden, it just, all the alarms started going off. Wow, something really special happened. Something unusual happened here. And we don't know what it is. We began to look at weapons and wounds from Europe in the same time period, 14th, 15th century. And the types of weapons they used were halberds, these big, long battle axes, where they, they do keep, keep an enemy away from you with one of those things, and then knock their legs out from under them, if you can. Hit them in the legs. And then while they're down on their knees, then you go over and you whack them over the head, you know, with a, with a, with a sword. That's what happened here. Leg wounds, defensive arm wounds, and head wounds. Almost the same kind of pattern. So again, looking at something happened here, an encounter with Europeans. And on the same site, bingo, there's a sword. There's a sword. With a basket hilt kind of a, a thing on it here that represents a time period again, about early 16th century. Uh, they made these in Venice. They made them in southern Germany. Uh, these were usually, this is a broad sword, so it was more like what a soldier would use. Some of these had nice long skinny little things, we call that a rapier. Uh, that was not what this was. But they sometimes they had basket hilt rapiers. This is a basket hilt broadsword found there on that same site in, in Rome. And that's a, re, a reconstruction of that same village in Rome. Same one. The house I showed you a minute ago was one of these houses right over here, up next to the wall of the, uh, of the village. So that's what those, that's a very typical, I mean, lots of villages from that time period look just like that. So you got houses here, you got crops being grown in here, you got a council house, you got a big open square, all up next to a river, and probably a, a, a royal house, a, a chief's house, chief's family house, you know, something like that. Very, very typical. And this is exactly what DeSoto encountered and DeLuna encountered when they came when they came through. This is a drawing of one of those kind of villages from the Mississippi River from around 1600. Same thing. You've even got little guard houses here, you know, or to protect, uh, to it's lookouts. And so you've got lots of things, a lot of little details that we see from these villages. Well, DeSoto arrives at Cusa in 1540. This was the peak. This was the peak. Everything else was downhill after that. Everything that happened with the Indians, everything that happened with the Spanish expedition, everything went downhill after this moment right here when DeSoto arrived at Cusa in 1540. He went through, he started from Tampa, Florida, made his way up through Georgia, kept hearing about this, this place at Cusa. He was looking for the gold. DeSoto had been the number two guy on the Pizarro expedition in Peru. It was all about going into the mountains and looking for the gold. And that's what they did. And they all went, you know, they winding around. I'll show you the map here in a minute. And made it to Cusa, which was on the cusa River in Gordon County right there on the border of Gordon County and Murray County uh, in northwest Georgia. 
And that was a big moment. This is the chief being carried on a litter with all these principal men carrying him. Only principal men were allowed to come near this chief. His feet were not supposed to touch the ground. That's why he lived on a mound. His feet were not supposed to touch common ground. When he came down off the mound, he was carried around. And this litter, the, the, the Sato talked about this being him covered in white feathers. All in white, in white feathers. Uh, and these people were playing flutes. These men here were playing flutes and some were carried, were covered in skins of different animals. Uh, those kinds of things. And here was the Sato. So these two groups were seeing each other for the first time. Oh my gosh, you know, it was like people from Mars meeting people from Venus. I mean, you know, they just, it was just like aliens had come to visit Northwest Georgia and the Spanish thought, Oh my gosh, we're in alien territory now. I mean, it was just a real interesting clash of, of cultures at that, at that moment. The Soto, of course, was looking for the gold, didn't find the gold, came on down here to Cartersville, moved on down uh, into Alabama, and other things happened on his expedition we may touch on as we, as we go through. He kidnapped people, he put people in chains. He figured out this whole royal family thing early. The Soto figured it out. He said, ah, I know how to, I know how to really get these people. You capture the chief, and then you get the chief's sister, and then you get the chief's niece and the chief's nephew, and you get all of them together and you put them all in chains, and those people will do anything that I want them to do. And that was true. You know, these people were horrified. Oh my gosh, our royal family. And then, and then put them on horses, you know, and carry them through. The people were crying. Oh my gosh, you know, look what they've done. He's doing to our, to our elite. You know, the, the, it would be like everybody in England watching the Queen of England and Prince Charles and everybody else being, being put in chains and carried down, you know, along down the street. I mean, it was the same horrifying experience for these, for these people. They just couldn't imagine that all this was happening. That scene that I just showed you, that scene right there happened right there. That is the re-regulation lake at Carter's Dam. Paul's here. Paul worked there for many years. Uh, that's a, you know, there's the big dam up there. This is the re-regulation dam. Before it was filled up with water, this is where we did a lot of the archaeology work there in the 1970s, early 70s. That's what it looked like from up above. Same thing down in there. And again, it was an area that DeSoto talked about uh, when he came there. And he stayed there for, for a while uh, looking for gold. He figured if he was going to find the gold, this would be it. The most powerful chiefdom in the southeast. Uh, he kept hearing that when he left Tallahassee, Florida. He was going to Coosa. And when he got there, he just knew the gold had to be there somewhere and stayed there for about a month. Uh, looking for that, looking for that gold. Uh, who's that guy? I put that up there sometimes when I do this with my children in the audience so they can see that I really had hair at one time. You know, <laughs> 1972. Uh, working those little squares, those little squares I was talking about, those little one-foot squares, and you're just hacking the dirt out and putting it in a plastic bag and sending it off to the, to the laboratory. Well, let's look at these Spanish expeditions in the southeast because we're setting the stage for this, again, this apocalyptic moment after De Soto came through. You had Ponce de Leon in 1513, and he made a trip in here on this side of Florida, made a trip back over to this side, got lost a little bit, and made his way back down there. He made another expedition in 1521. Came back to the same area. Again, didn't quite find some of the things that he was looking for. Encountered some hostile natives, in that, uh, native people in that part of the world. In 1526, uh, Ion came to the coast of Georgia. We don't know exactly where he landed, but we think we know that it was somewhere right around St. Simons. Could have been a little bit south of there, but we're still looking for that landing place of Ion. Uh, John Worth, who you'll hear me mention more of tonight. John Worth came and worked with me in Northwest Georgia for two or three years in Calhoun uh, with the Kuswati Foundation. He's now at the University of West Florida. Brilliant guy, absolutely brilliant. Did his undergraduate, graduate degree and his PhD all in six years, you know, and went to Spain and translated 10,000 pages worth of material. After everybody said, no, nah, you're not going to find any stuff in Spain in, in those archives that anybody's ever seen. He found 10,000 pages nobody had seen before, not in the past 500 years, and translated all of it and figured out all kinds of things about the coast of Georgia and the settlement of the Spanish in the southeast. I mean, fabulous stuff. So he's, he's still around. John's, and we'll talk, talk more about him in a few minutes. Then came this, uh, this, this, Narvez uh, expedition in 1528 that went along the coast and he documented a lot of things. He made a lot of maps. 
Uh, some people died, lots of people died on these expeditions. Either ships got wrecked or the Indians would kill them. I mean, all kinds of, these expeditions, none of them were very pleasant. None of them were very successful in terms of discovering a whole lot other than making some maps and getting some good information about what was going on. But that was about, that was about it. Uh, then came DeSoto. Okay, so you see DeSoto's trip was the first time somebody really made an attempt to go to the interior. And it was a big trip. I mean, it lasted two or three years. And, you know, 1539 to 1543. And, yeah, we don't have enough time here tonight to tell all the great stories coming out of that expedition. I'll tell you a book that you need to read if you really want a good book. And it's called Warriors of the Knights of Spain, Warriors of the Sun. And it's by Charles Hudson. Knights of Spain, you can remember that part. And Charles Hudson. Fantastic book because he weaves together all the diary accounts of this expedition. The detail in there is so rich. I love reading that book. And I'll go back, I've read it two or three times and I just never get tired of it. You could make a movie, you could make a, a 15 part you know, mini series out of it and, and not have to make anything up. You know, just use the real stuff in there, you know. They, they were, DeSoto almost died one time because it was a captive Indian that he had that they had and the guy broke loose out of his chains and he just beat the crap out of DeSoto. He just, he almost killed him. Uh, and they, before they could get him off of it, you know. So, I mean, the things about soldiers, things about these arrows and how deadly these arrows were, you know, with these, all these encounters, all the things that went on. And DeSoto driving 700, 600 pigs through the southeast. You know, that was his emergency food supply, you know. And somebody said, well, how fast could this expedition go? Well, the answer is only as fast as the pigs could walk, you know. Well, sometimes the pigs were bringing up the rear. You know, they were coming along a day, a day later, half a day later. But that was, that was what happened to this expedition. It's quite an interesting expedition with lots of great detail. And we'll come back to some of that in, in a little bit because some of it's important to talk about Northwest, Northwest Georgia. And that trip, it tells, this is another map of the same trip with lots of names of these places, all the names. Now it took us a number of years, it took us a long time to put this together with what's actually in the ground because their maps were not very good at all. You can imagine, they didn't know where they were and they didn't have surveying equipment, and they didn't have GPS, and they didn't have any of that. And so we were able to put this together. Charles Hudson, Marvin Smith, who's from Rome, Chester de Prater, did this work by using archaeological evidence that we have that's current. So they did this in the 1980s, early 1980s. And I was able to help with the little stuff, the stuff that I found when I was a teenager, uh, help figure out and confirm that these were the villages in there on Kusa uh, that were on that little, little stretch here on the Kusawati River to confirm what they were looking at here. You know, how far could they go in a day? What did they talk about? Which rivers did they cross? They went three and a half leagues a day. Well, three and a half leagues, is that old leagues? It's only 2.2 miles per league or league commune, which was 3.5 miles. I mean, this is all the stuff that they went through in their research and figured this out this, and, and matched this up to archaeological sites. Now there's another map from, from about 19, the 1930s, 1930s, 1940s, 1940. That was the, you know, supposed to be the 400th anniversary of DeSoto's expedition. So there was a commission. Well, they tried to do a map and they kind of goofed it up because they were looking at sites, archaeological sites that didn't match time periods. You know, they tried to put Toa way over here because there was a mound that showed up over here. They never showed them going way up in here. So there's still places up in here in North Carolina that have the old, you know, 1939 historical markers. DeSoto came through here, you know, in Franklin, North Carolina. Boy, and those people fight you over it, you know. Yeah, we know he came through here. We know for sure. No, nah, he, didn't, he didn't go through there. You know, this is the, <laughs> this is the route. He went up through Ch uh, Asheville, North Carolina came down the, uh, the river there and, and made it across into the Smokies, the French Broad River, came down the Tennessee River and was on his way to, to Coosa here. So great, long, you know, interesting trip. How he finally got to Mexico out of all of this is another fascinating story. Oh my gosh, these guys survived. They built boats, you know, at the very end of the expedition and took those boats down the Mississippi River. I mean, the last three or four days of that trip were just, I mean, you know, the Indians were, had just hordes of people firing on them with arrows out of these canoes, all dressed in different colors of these canoes and these Indians. I mean, it was like something out of a Japanese, you know, Kurosawa movie. It was just fantastic stuff, you know, and how they made it down through the, the Mississippi River and made it all the way to Mexico. And by the time they got to Mexico, when they showed up in Mexico, they were wearing skins, nice 
skin clothing that they traded with the Indians to make. And, uh, and people marveled at their clothes and marveled at their stories. And they were celebrities in Mexico for a long time, you know, the rest of their lives, that they had survived this expedition. Well, guess what? They kidnapped some people that went with them. They kidnapped some folks from Cusa all the way up in here. They kidnapped some other Indians up and down in here. Some of them, they kidnapped 50 or 60 at a time or 100 at a time to carry their baggies. They'd force them to do that, you know, under... You know, with swords and dogs, you know, they'd force these Indians as, as burden bearers with them. Well, then after a while, you know, they were in such bad shape, some of these Indians were just going with them without any, any chains. Uh, now, DeSoto would kill a bunch of them and, and then go get some other people at the next village, another village. Terrible, terrible way to treat these, these, these people. And they remembered it because they were angry uh, even, even many years later when the Luna came back, 20 years later. They didn't like these Spanish characters uh, showing up. But some people went all the way to Mexico with DeSoto's expedition, made it all the way to Mexico City. And now they were going to come back 20 years later acting as interpreters and guides on this other expedition that we're going to talk about. So there's another one in 1549 called Luis Cancer, who was a uh, religious guy. Uh, he, he didn't make it. I mean, he, he got killed his first day on land, you know, down near, near Tampa, Florida, his first week or so. It was a, a, a failure of an expedition. And then here comes the Luna expedition, the one we're going to talk about in a little more detail. Tristan de Luna, 1559-61. And look, going right back up to Cusa again. Going right back up to Cusa, coming from Mexico. And we're going to talk about why and how he did that uh, in, in, more, in more detail. This is 1566 to 1570. Uh, Menendez de Aviles, okay? That's when you get St. Augustine being founded. That's when you get... All these other things. That, this is also part of, uh, actually that came a little later, but this was part of the Pardo expedition that went all the way back up in here, retracing part of the DeSoto expedition backwards up in here, went all the way up in here, and that fort up there has just been found recently in the past couple of years, three or four years, uh, of part of that Pardo expedition trying to get back into the landscape. And then is what we call Spanish Florida period, 1587 to 1763. St. Augustine was founded. Some of these other places are missions. They're all out in here. Uh, I think they've actually found one of them down near Valdosta now, uh, found it off of a rest area for the expressway. Isn't that right, Tom? You know that where Marvin Smith and somebody found one. So, there, so these things are real. Uh, the, and this, this, this mission system of the Spanish really getting hold of, the span, of, the, of this land and trying to make that happen. Well, let's go on to the Deluna expedition, because before that, going back to the DeSoto expedition, look at that for a minute, and now, look at what was going on here in 1559. All this part, we would call this the Spain's New World Empire. All this area, you know, with all these named places in Mexico, all the way down in here to Panama, the coast of Cartagena, you know, the coast of... Colombia and, and, and uh, Venezuela, uh, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, you know, these areas of Cuba. These were all occupied and well known. This was completely unoccupied, unoccupied. The only thing that happened up there, the only interior thing that happened was DeSoto. So the king of Spain went, wait a minute, we got to do something about that because we got some French characters way up here in Newfoundland. We are starting to make some, we're worried about those French. And we don't know how far it is from Newfoundland down to Florida. It could be just really close by. We're not quite sure. Uh, but we got to do something because we got all these riches. We got all this stuff coming out of Mexico and these islands. And the French are out here and they're capturing our ships and they're giving us all kinds of trouble. And this is going to be, a, this is a fight over this territory. And we got to do something about that. We got to get in here. And we've got to establish some permanent settlements in here before the French get there. So that was a big part of their, of their, uh, of their plan. And this was, this, was part, this was a big part of the plan. They were going to do three things. They were going to put a fort here, which is what we know of as Pensacola today. They, they had landed and done something over here briefly called Santa Elena. And we now know it's right where Paris Island is, the marine base over there. But this is right in there in that part of South Carolina. And they said, okay, we want those two. We've got to tie those two together somehow. We want to create a new fort here, a new fort there. And this Coosa thing, we think it's between these two. We think it's probably right in there. Well, 
it wasn't. It was way up there. But that was the, that was the plan. That was the plan. And this is the governor of Mexico, of Mexico, Luis de Velasco. He was the viceroy, essentially the governor, but the viceroy of New Spain. And with, with direct orders from the king, yes, that's what we need to do. Absolutely. We've got to protect ourselves on, these, on this, what's going on with the French. So make it happen. Velasco, make it happen. So Velasco starts working. Now, Velasco was a pretty sharp, pretty smart guy. Now, you've got to understand the context of Mexico in this time period. It's fascinating stuff. I mean, you've got Cortez who came. You've got all these guys who were around Cortez. All these people know each other really well, and they're intermarried. You know, Velasco, uh, uh, Mendoza, who was there, who was the viceroy, the first uh, viceroy there. Uh, they were intermarried. Uh, In-laws, all these folks knew each other. You know, and, and, and you could make money. You could, be, you could make some money, even if you didn't make it on gold and silver. Gold and silver, that was the big jackpot. Okay, Pizarro had done that in Peru, and they'd made some money like that in some of these other, South, other Central American countries. They'd made a little, done that in Mexico a little bit, a couple of places. They had some mines staked out in northern Mexico, and, uh, and then you know, off, off they went, trying to do, make the same thing happen in New Mexico and Arizona. You know, the cities of gold and all that stuff that they were trying to make, make happen and didn't, and didn't find that. Uh, but they tried. They were trying. They were trying. Gold was the big deal. But you could make money without, without that. You could set up yourself with a big plantation and use all this Indian labor in this system that they allowed to have happen. It was an official system where the crown would get part of that, part of your, you know, what you did. And it was sort of like a Sort of like you were a, a tenant farmer, only you were a big fancy tenant farmer. And you had all this slave labor working for you, you know, who were really the bottom of the... And they were the Indian folks and anybody else that you could get to work for you. And some of them were, were black slaves, too. And they were all those folks out there. Okay, so you could figure out a way to, to make yourself into a system like that. Well, here was DeLuna. You know, DeLuna had been sort of on one of those expeditions up into the southwest... He had been one of the, the captains on one of those. Uh, and so he, and he, was, he, was, he was related to Velasco. He, had a, you know, his, he was related to Velasco's wife. And then Velasco's wife was related to Cortez's family. And so there, was, there were all these relationships. So DeLuna said, okay, I'm old enough now. He was about 50-something years old, 55. He'd done, he tried to make it happen. Uh, with, his, with his thing uh, up in the southwest. That really didn't work out too well for him. He married a woman who was really important. She'd been married to two other guys who died. Uh, I mean, all this stuff, there's so, so, much, uh, so much intermarriage and crazy intrigue going on. Well, he married her, married into money with her. Well, then she died. She died. So he had two children, and he was in charge of their uh, estates. And he was trying to cobble together enough money in their estate that had come down from her family and trying to preserve that, at the same time to invest that into something else that he could make for himself. He came from a, wealthy, a somewhat wealthy family in Spain, but they didn't have much money. And his, his brother was the oldest brother of that family, and that guy had inherited all the, you know, all the family money, and he was the second son. He wasn't going to make any money off of the old, old money in Spain, so he had to do something of his own. So he lobbied hard to be the head of this expedition. Tristan de Luna, he was going to be the head of this expedition. And Velasco was helping him out, getting all the stuff together, getting all the materials together. It was going to be a really big expedition. This was the first colonizing expedition out of Mexico, out of Mexico City. The rest had all been kind of gold-seeking. This was going to be a really big deal uh, for Velasco, for everybody. And so the king, everybody was invested mentally, physically, Financially, everybody was invested in this, in this expedition. And so we got a lot of good records on this expedition. A lot of things going on with this expedition. Coming out of Mexico City and the church was involved. And they, picked the, they picked the religious characters who were going on this trip very carefully. And one of the key ones was Domingo de la Anunciación. Well, the Domingo de la Anunciación was fluent in three or four Indian languages. I mean, he was a real scholar. A Dominican priest, and so they chose him carefully to head this the religious part of this expedition. Um, and so he writes lots of things. A lot of the information we get out of, out of this thing comes from his diaries, his diary accounts. So they make the, here's the uh, this is one of the old maps. How do you get from Mexico City down to the uh, down to the coast to Veracruz, where 
all these ships are going to sail from. And so they start to leave. You know, they're leaving. They're going to leave Mexico City. Now, you know, I'm going to do something a little different that I normally don't do, but I'm going to stop for two or three minutes and let you ask some questions, if you've got some questions. And I might do that again a little later, rather than having to wait until the end. Uh, if you've got some questions now, go ahead, you know, raise your hand if you've got a question. And if you don't, you can jump in later with a question if you've got something. Yeah? So the English in Jamestown and Plymouth Yes. That's right. That's so right. There's no English. English are not at, are not at play in this at all. That's right. The English were starting to make you know some some noise down in the Caribbean, you know, and of course it's all about navies too fighting each other, and so the English were were about to launch something up there in Massachusetts, you know, in this, and but they hadn't done that yet. So this is all Spanish against French in this in this time period. English aren't a factor. Yes. Okay, that would be coming where the French Broad River comes into the Tennessee River, breaks the mountains right in there. That would be one of the first sites. DeSoto wasn't there very long. He was just kind of passing through. So he went through the mountains, and he comes through, he comes through the, the hills, and immediately when he comes through the hills, in the first village he comes to, uh, they say, Welcome, you are now in the province of Cusa. Ah, you're under the, we're under the kingdom of Cusa. Okay, so he knows, okay. You know, well, how far away is Cusa? Well, it's this many days away, five days, six days. It's, it's further down, down that way. And so then every day, another emissary would come to where DeSoto was. And he would say, you are now four days from Cusa. You know, uh, the king of Cusa awaits you. Well, and then the third day, you're the king of Cusa awaits you. And they'd come with these feathers, these white feathers. White feathers meant you were coming in peace. Red feathers look out, you know, that, that, that war. The white feathers have come in peace. So I don't know the exact sites. I don't know if we found those, but there is a series of villages on the Tennessee River that match this time period. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't seen any reports lately of Spanish materials from those sites, but I'm sure, they're, I'm sure somebody has found some. But they weren't there very long. They were just there overnight. They were moving kind of quick coming down through there because they wanted to get to Cusa. They wanted to get to Cusa. Yes? Ah, very good. Well, they essentially, the question was, why didn't the Spanish make any attempts to claim it? Well, they kind of did. You know, they thought, well, we're calling this all Florida, Florida. And so, hey, we've already claimed that when we, you know, when we claimed Florida, you know, back in the 1619, I mean, 1519, 1520. So we're just exploring more of the territory that we've already claimed. That's kind of what they were, that's what their thinking was all about. Now, what's interesting about that question is that, uh, John Worth, who I mentioned before, who did all this research at the archives in Spain, John was in there in those archives and mucking around, and, and he was looking for 16th century stuff. Well, for some reason, he went over into the 18th century material. And I don't know why he was in there. I don't remember the story. But he looked, and he saw something that was a different color of material. It looked like it was darker. Okay. He pulls it out. Well, it's a whole set of maps from the 16th century, a whole set of materials, a whole report from the 16th century. And what happened was that the king of Spain in the 1700s, after Oglethorpe, you know, came and started doing all this stuff in Georgia on that coast, the king of Spain at that time said, wait a minute, we've been in that territory for a long time. We've been doing things in there for 200 years. Somebody get in there and do a report. So somebody went down and pulled all these maps together and put together this report, and that's what John found was a report where somebody was going back 200 years and pulling together all those materials. So John, so that's, but that's, a, good, that's a good question. So they, the, the, Spanish, the Spanish had claimed it, but then, hey, your claim was only as good as you were able to get up there and protect it, essentially. You had a question. Uh, we don't hear much about native villages on the kind of site. Was it just heavily populated as Cusco? It was, uh, perhaps, we have not done as much research on the kind of saga. We have seen a couple of sites on the kind of saga that do have materials that match. Now we haven't seen Spanish materials on the kind of saga, but we have found pottery that does match. And I suspect there may be a few Spanish materials there. There's, there's one mound in particular, I think it's called the Davis Mound, it's right up almost on the Tennessee border on the kind of saga there. And it's a little bit older time period, but I think it also has the 16th century time period 
with it as well. But that's a that's a good question. Yes. Well, I, I got a question about King's side. Um, okay. Robert Blakely put out an article in I think the nineties. Uh, right. King's side talking about uh, confirming uh, cuts on the bones. Cuts on the bones. And I was wondering, and then George Miller came out, mm -hmm. and Daniel Hutchinson and all the other people came out and said and contested that, uh, saying that they could also possibly be due to rodents or erosion. Or right. Good question. I know the criticisms too, and I'm not going to dispute the criticisms. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I, a lot of good information there. I was telling one side of the story, Blakely's story, and he told it first. So that's, that's it. But yes, there were some other things. There were other interesting things about those bones. They did have rodent marks on them. Uh, one of the reasons they were laid out flat is because it appears that those people died somewhere else that those bones were bundled up while they were still articulated. Articulated means that the bones were still joined together by the ligaments, bundled up perhaps further downriver at a battle called Mavila that, that the Soto was involved in. Maybe they got killed somewhere else. They were left out long enough that rodents had been eating on the bones some, yes. Bundled them up though, brought them back there and they buried them at the king site. So, you know, so yes, there is some conflicting information about the wounds on the... Thank you. Just yeah, you bet. Yeah, taking a little deeper dive into the information. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Anything else? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on and we'll, we'll have another Q&A period. Yes? When they travel between villages, yes. I can imagine all these people and animals and horses and yes. strung out for two miles through the woods yes. or something. Is it, was, did they travel on trails or roads? Or were they just Very good question. Some people think they're hacking their way through the woods. They're not. These Indians had very well-defined travel roads, trails. They were wide. I mean, they were wide enough that the, you know, the Spanish talked about being, you know, they could ride four or five horses abreast down some of these places. So these were, they were going, they were, they wanted to go to villages where the Indians were because they wanted to get their food. The food thing is a big deal. And we're gonna talk about it more in a minute, about the food. But that was a big part of why DeSoto, what DeSoto was counting on, was being able to get their food stores. So he wanted to go where the people were. Well, to get to where the people are, hey, just, just follow their trails because they got lots of little highways that lead to their villages. And why, why go hack my way through a, you know, through a jungle? I can just go down that trail. It's, that trail's going to take me somewhere. It's probably going to take me to somebody's village. And that's, what they, and that's what they did. And so they were stretched out sometimes you know, for a few miles. Sometimes they were a day ahead of some of the part of you know, There would be people who, people, there were some people on that expedition that paid their own way. You know, they went back to Spain, or they went to, you know, DeSoto was the number two guy on the DeSoto expedition. He took his money, went back to Spain and said, okay, I'm now going to lead an expedition to this other part of North America, and we're going to find riches just like we did in Peru. Who wants to go? Everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go. Oversubscribed. So people took their uncle's money, their granddaddy's money, everybody's money, piled on. Okay, so part of it was military, part of it were private private folks outfitted themselves with their own horses and all their own materials, their own servants, went off on the expedition. So some of them were angry as they went along the expedition. Where, why aren't we finding the gold? Where's others going? Why are we going so slow? So they, they, would, they would get at DeSoto at different times and prod him on. And he would say, okay, I'm taking off. And he'd, he'd, he'd take off a little faster with some lead groups of people and leave some other people three or four days behind. And then they'd all catch up. So there was some of that. There was some of that going on uh, as well. Well, let me talk. Let me go back to Deluna for a minute because this is—he's a fascinating character. And and you got to understand something. If this if this expedition had succeeded, might have changed the whole history of the southeastern part of the United States. I mean, you know, we have a Spanish flavor and presence to Florida, to what we know of the peninsula of Florida, but it might have changed the whole southern half of what we know as the United States today if this expedition had succeeded. So let's think of, let's talk about why it didn't succeed for a few minutes, okay. So De Luna, you know, here he was. This was really important to him financially. He'd also taken his children's trust funds and he was investing it in this expedition. Now he was gonna get a, he was getting a, he was getting a stipend, he was getting a, like an expense account from the king 
and the, through the governor, or the, the viceroy, and he was getting uh, so he was getting the, he was getting a salary and he was getting some expenses paid. Okay. So that was good. So he, you know, and if he succeeded, then he would be able to conquer this. Land. He'd be in control of a lot of this land, like like Cortez and Cortez's relatives had had in Flor in uh, Mexico, where those he'd have all these Indians working for him, you know, making stuff, you know, and 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 growing crops and selling those to the government and him taking a cut of it. So his financial future and present was absolutely hanging on this expedition. He had been the uh, executor, administrator of part of Cortez's family's estate about eight years before this expedition. And they were mad at him. They were suing him. They, start, they started a suit against him in 1552. This expedition was in 1559, 15. They started a lawsuit against him, 1552, because he took 14 black slaves out of their minds. And I don't know what he did with them, but he took these 14 black slaves and they were, they were angry. And they were after him in this lawsuit for eight years. They followed him to the ships. They followed him out of Mexico City. And everybody knew this big expedition was going. They waited. They waited until he got almost down to the boats. I mean, it's like the day before they're getting ready to disembark. And they, they had, they had, they had some, some police seize him and, and to get him. They were going to throw him in jail because of the lawsuit. Well, they knew they had him. They knew they had him up against the wall. You know, if they were going to squeeze anything out of him, now was going to be the moment to squeeze something out of him because he was about to take off on this other expedition. It was their way of making a claim against him early in case he was successful. They wanted to make a claim on him right then, reestablish their claim on him. So they did that the day he's leaving on the boat. They go and get him. Well, Velasco, Velasco's trying to help him out. Velasco's going, oh, man, you know, what else do I got to do to make this thing successful? Okay, well, Velasco gets involved and somehow gets the creditors off of him, get these, this family off of him, and, and he's getting on the boat. The, next, the, the, the day after that happens, as he's getting on the boat, he sends a, a request to the king of Spain asking for a 30% increase in his salary <laughs> and a 30% increase in his, in his expense account. Why? Well, something to do with those creditors. It was something to do with those creditors. I mean, I, I wish we could dig deeper into some of, that, some of those uh, records and, and find out more about that. And we may. We may find out all this stuff. But it's the fascinating personal details that, that, that are at stake here, I, I think, are really interesting. Because it, it comes into play in the part of why this expedition, you know, some of the failures on this expedition later. Okay, so they sail off. 1,500 people. 1,500 people on this expedition. Now, the, you know, they got soldiers. A bunch of them are soldiers. Well, a bunch of them are farmers and artisans. and people. All these people are going to go and, and create this colony. That's great. But Velasco says, hey, man, look, you know, you're, you're piling up a bunch of people that don't need to go. You got too many people. You got too many people with too many mouths to feed. This is not a good thing. And he said, and I wish I had the, the side take. He said, oh, and, and I hear that, that uh, some of these soldiers, they've got, they've got women with them that are not there. Some of them are bringing their families, you know, their wives and their children. Uh, you know, it's just too much. And I even hear that this one soldier, he's got a woman with him. It's not his wife, and she's a singer. You know, like that was some kind of big, you know, big problem, you know, that she was this singer, you know. Uh, so it just goes, I mean, the whole, the details get, get fantastic. But, but the Velasco is saying, I'm telling you, there are too many mouths to feed, and, and I, this is not a good thing. You know, here are all the provisions, here's all the stuff, all the stores, let's go. And they got 200 horses, 300 horses, they got cattle, they got everything you can imagine. 13 ships, and off they go. You know, they're going off to, 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 to land. And they had figured out, they sent somebody ahead to figure out where to land, and they got off course somehow, made this little thing here, they bang up here, and they finally find where they're, where they're trying to go. Now they're looking at Mobile Bay in here, they know that's not where they want to be. They're over here, there's one thing that, that says they were even down here as far as down here. But they land where they wanted to be, which was Pensacola Bay. They thought, this is a great bay. This is the best bay we've seen anywhere in, North, in on this part of the world. You know, we just, it's just fantastic. The way it's protected, from nothing can stop, nothing can hurt any ships in this, in this bay. It's just fantastic. Well, a hurricane hit. Five days, seven, seven, they had not been there but five days, six days, they landed. Started unloading ships, 
they start saying, okay, we got to sing a, a, send some people back to Mexico, tell them about that we got here okay, we can send in letters, send it out people, we're going to start exploring where we're going to build a village. We've got all these plans for building a village, we're unloading one of the ships, starting to do that. Bang! 13 ships. Almost all of them go down. Two of them do not. This one ship uh, did not go down. It got pushed up onto the sand somehow. Uh, and, the next, and boy, they got everything off that ship quick. There wasn't a thing left on that ship. They stripped it bare. All their other supplies, all that food for all those people went down in the, before they, they had not unloaded all that stuff. Oh boy, okay. Now, now the bad stuff starts happening. Because now, wow, what do you do now? Well, all these farmers, how do they, they, they got to go clear fields and grow crops. How are they going to do that fast enough to make things really work? Hunters? Well, they're not used to hunting out there in the woods. You know, what, what's that all about? Oh, my gosh. So bad things start to, start to unfold. They start to explore different things. Here is a, a list of all the things that happened between 1559 and 1561. There are relief fleets that start happening. Back to Velasco's getting the letters going, okay, i got to help out. i got to pull some ships together. How do I do that? Where do I find the relief? Does it come from Havana? Does it come from Mexico City? Trying to find ships to send them some relief. There were some, and there were some evacuations. They start fight, get rid of some of these people, send some of these women and children back to Mexico. How do we, we got to feed fewer people. Third relief fleet, fourth relief fleet. Internally, the hurricane destroys the fleet. Supply ships to and from Havana. 200 sh soldiers start exploring inland. The colony moves to a little town called Nanipacana, uh, further inland. 200 soldiers sent to Cusa. We're going to talk about that in a minute because that was really important. It tells us a lot about what's going on internally uh, in there. The colony returns to it. These soldiers return from Cusa. All these things are happening. So this expedition is falling apart. De Luna, is, oh, he's just, oh my gosh. I mean, think about that. The guy thinks, oh man, he's about to get out of the trouble. He's about to get all of his, all of his financial things fixed. And bang, hurricane hits. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Well, he isn't going to call it quits at all. He isn't going to do that. He's got too much at stake. All these people want to go back to Mexico City. They start, they start keeping really good records because they're going to sue him when they get back. That's what they're doing. They're saying that. Oh, yeah, we're going to file suit. So they keep these really detailed records of every meeting that takes place, every order, every discussion about whether they should go back or not. And so the Lunas keeps, he keeps trying to push people onto Cusa. No, no, Cusa is what we're supposed to be doing. We've got to go to Cusa. We've got to get on up there. There's food up there. There's food up there. Remember everybody, everybody that was on that expedition? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of food at Cusa. Yeah, we've got to go to Cusa. All of that. But at the same time, he's thinking, well, if I leave people down there on the coast and I go to Cusa, are they going to leave me? Are they going to go back to Mexico City? How am I going to control these people? I mean, he's... He's all flipped out, and he's and got a fever at the same time. And I mean, the guy's having a nervous breakdown, and so they're trying to sue him, and all kinds of terrible things are happening. So that's what happens. They start moving the expedition up and down to you know, Cusa, and they start moving these 200 people up into Cusa. And that's where we start picking up a lot of good information about what happens up there from the diaries, and from the diaries particularly of these priests that make it up there. And remember, they're going and tracking along this area where DeSoto had been. So they're going back to some of the same villages again and again. So that's where we begin to look at what happened in that 20 years. What's happened to the Indians during that 20 years? This apocalypse, remember, that's the point of this conversation. What's the apocalypse all about? Well, they're beginning to see abandoned villages. They see those down here in Nanipacana. The Nanipacana itself has 80 houses. Well, that's great. That's a nice sized village. Yeah, there's another 80 or 90 that are abandoned. Meaning, these people have died. People have started dying. Now, they're not dying in one big, you know, one big wave of, of, of death of an epidemic. They're dying in smaller epidemics. You know, flu, mumps, measles, chicken pox. You know, you get an epidemic of, of knocks the, the population down 2% or 3%. Then another one, two or three percent, and another two or three percent, and you're starting to mess up your food systems. Your infant mortality rates are going up. Your birth rates are going down. All these things are starting to happen during that period. And those are some of the things that we start to, to read about in these accounts, these, these villages that are vacant.
these problems that they're having in those internal places. Well, they make it all the way up here. At Taiba, that's Etowah. That's where, that's where we are, right there. That's where Etowah gets its name. It's from the Spanish word Itaba, and that's what the Spanish, where the Indians were calling themselves. When they make it up to here, they're starving to death. I mean, these, these, these Spanish folks are starving to death. Their horses are starving. They don't have anything to feed them. They're trying to get food from the Indians. The Indians don't have a lot of food. The Indians start starting to get angry. Hey, you know what? We're not going to give them any food. No, we're going to strip all the land around them of every food stuff you can imagine because we don't like those people. We remember what DeSoto did to us. We're not going to help them out. When they get up to Cusa, the Cusa, and you say, okay, we'll help, we'll help you out. And they start, they, they build rafts, canoes, loading up corn, and start sending it down river. And they actually make it all the way down. They send this corn all the way down the river there uh, to the people down, down below. So they are helping them up here when they get to Cusa. But the Indians at Cusa are pretty, are pretty smart about some things. Remember what's going on at Cusa. Cusa is the primary location, the capital of this big empire. Now the empire is starting to crumble a little bit. And that's what they're starting to hear. The Spanish are starting to hear that. The Spanish hear from the Cusa. Hey, hey, we helped you out last week, you know, with all this corn and all this stuff. But we need your help on something. Really, what do you need? Well, we got some, we got some characters up here. You know, right up, right up here. We, you know, somewhere up here on this other river, and they're called the Napoches, and they have not been paying their tribute to us. They are causing trouble on the roads. They're blocking our roads, our pathways, that all kind of communication. They're causing all kinds of. They've even raided a village or two, you know. And and we hear that they've got, you know, they've ca- captured a couple of people and strung them up in the middle of their villages, torturing them. You know, we cannot have that happen. Okay, we're going to help you out. So the Spanish send this letter. Yeah, we're going to help these guys out. We know there's some of these letters. You know, about, yeah, we're going, to go, we're going to help them out on this, this, little, this little expedition to, to teach the Napoches a lesson. So here's, here's, remember, the, remember the chief 20 years before being carried on the white litter? His feet weren't supposed to touch the ground? Okay. They get ready to go off on this expedition, and the chief comes out, and they're carrying him on their back. You know, they don't have a litter anymore. So he's going to go on this expedition. So they got him on their, on their back. And they're starting to march. Well, they're marching in this formation, this big open box formation. And there's Indians. There's about three or 400 Indians on this expedition. There's a bunch of them here, a bunch of them here, a bunch of them here, a bunch of them here. And they're marching, showing their domination over the four corners of the earth. You know, that's what they're supposed to show in this open box in the middle where the chief is. And the chief's being carried on somebody's back, piggyback his feet aren't supposed to touch the ground. Well, they go like that for a few miles and somebody else carries him and that guy gets tired and finally they just say, you got to walk. So the chief has to walk. So, so you, begin, you begin to see what's going on here. You know, there's some breakdown of stuff going on. The, the other funny thing is that they get ready to go on this little raiding party and the Indians all get gathered up there and they're getting their arrows together and their bows and getting all strung up and all ready. And uh, okay, we're ready. And then somebody says among the Indians, uh, who's got the food? Well, you're supposed to get the food. No, you're supposed to get oh, There's this big fight that goes on for an hour while they get food together because they all forgot about that. They're all so hyped up to fight, they forgot they had to have some food. We, 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 great little details that we learn from this, this stuff. Okay, so they go marching out, you know, and it takes them about two days. Well, they stop at night somewhere. Somewhere between here, which is, you know, the... Uh, the Carter's Dam area, and up here where we think, we think it's on the banks of the Tennessee River, somewhere in between in there is an old mount that they come up on. And they stop at night, and they're having this thing, and the chief's going to give them a big, big pitch, you know. He's going to get them all hyped up. So the chief starts talking about all of the, the terrible things that these people have done to them, you know. And we're going to teach them a lesson tomorrow. And he turns around, and he takes these little red seeds and puts them in his mouth. Well, in the description, they say they are some sort of red fern seeds. Well, it's red sumac, right? I, I mean, that's what it's got to be. And so he puts the red sumac seeds in his mouth, you know, and it's, it's August or September, so they would be ripe. They would be red. And gets them all in his mouth, you know, and, until the red's just running out of his, running down his chin, you know. And he's saying, and, and we're going to... We're going we're gonna to teach them a lesson and the blood's going to run. And then we're going to spit them out just like I'm going to spit out these seeds. Good. He spits them out and the Indians all go wild. You know, they're going yeah, to go get them. 
So the next day, they do. They get up to this little village, and they think they're being, you know, quiet. Well, they get there, and the village is abandoned. They figured out they were coming for them. And so they, they abandoned Well, there's one poor Indian that's sick in the village, left. And uh, they go, well, what are we going to do with him? Well, the Indians are going to kill him. You know, and they start beating on him, and they're cutting on him. And the, the priest steps in. The priest went on this expedition. And the priest is this Annunciacion, who speaks all these languages. He's going, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We cannot do that to this guy. You know, you can't. This, this is not the way we're going to treat this poor, this poor guy. He's going to die anyway. And so they tried to, you know, give him some water and do anything to him. And the priest gave him some last rites, and the guy, the guy died. So they said, well, we're still going to go get him. So they go to the bank of the river, the big river. And we, you know, we don't know what big river, but we think it's the Tennessee River. These Indians are on the other side laughing at them. Ah, oh, you know, ah, oh, you can't. Spanish pull out a gun, boom. Kill one of the guys on the other side. Wow. Okay, so they all go over there, and these Indians are all laying down. You know, they're just all terrified. So they capture them. They're going to cut them up and kill them. And again, the priest steps in and goes, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. We're going to do it. We're going to do a negotiated settlement. So they all sit down. And the priest lays out with the Indians, okay, they're going to pay their tribute from now on, and this is what the tribute's going to be. And they lay out all the things that they're going to pay to the chief of Cusa. And it's fascinating. You get a lot of detail out of that. Well, you know, you'd think, well, it must be corn, right? No. It was exotic things that they couldn't get themselves. You know, certain kinds of nuts or certain kinds of maybe chestnuts or certain things that they wouldn't have as a normal kind of food store. Uh, that's, what the, that's what the chief of Kusa wanted as tribute, the kind of special items. So we learned a lot from that. We learned about the communication systems. We learned about this breakdown that's going on. They couldn't control what was happening. They weren't as grand anymore. I mean, those are the kinds of things we learned from these little details of these, of these diary accounts. Just to show you a little bit about where those things occurred, you know, here on the, on the, on the river there, that is that area of, uh, on the Kusawati that where I've done most of my work, this is I-75 about right here, Nui Chota, Cherokee capital is about here. Uh, these are these other sites uh, that we've done all this work on over that period of time. That's where, where Carter's Dam is. So we have found Spanish materials at every one of those, of those villages on the, uh, on the river there. This is one of those, porch farm site, one of the largest villages. This is another indication of a breakdown of an apocalypse. We had all these big villages. We had these villages all strung out. All of a sudden, some of these villages are getting a lot bigger. Porch Farm is one of them. This one down here is getting bigger. These sites are getting bigger because people are dying in other places and they're coming, they're aggregating into these villages, aggregating into these villages. So they're getting bigger during that time period and other, other villages are getting, are getting smaller. This is one of those big villages. And at this big village, we found some interesting things. Uh, this is a cache of really finely made points, projectile points, true arrow tips. There were 120 of these in this one cache of these things. Only one white one and only one red one. Now, we think these were paid as tribute to the person who was buried there. Uh, these were found by some looter in the 1980s. Um, and so we don't know a lot, but we do know that these were the things that were in there. Incredibly finely made. These things are so delicate. They're not thick. They're very thin. I had a little box. The guy handed me a box of them, and my hands were shaking because I didn't want to drop them. And they were tinkling like glass. I mean, they were that nicely made and that, that sharp. And again, one white one, one red one, all placed perhaps by different individuals into this grave. All these were made by different people. We know that because the styles of each ones were a little bit different. And so those are some of the things that were in that. And I'll show you something else that was in there in a, in a second. Some of these beads, these are clay beads, these are glass beads, these are chevron beads. This is a blown glass bead. That is a little square bead called Nueva Cadiz. Uh, you're going to see that again in a minute. Come up, there they are in a little more detail. Now these are important because the way these are made and the colors in there, the ways they are made, uh, we can date those within 10 years of when they were manufactured by the, by the, by the layers of the glass and the colors that are in the glass in those. Uh, there is the tip off of a crossbow arrow. That was in the same group with those projectile points. So this is a Spanish tip off of a crossbow arrow in the same cache with those others that were made by people of, uh, of Cusa. 
You're going to see that come up again in a minute. A horseshoe, a Spanish part of a Spanish horseshoe. This is further down river. As I was reading this material in the past few weeks again about this expedition and what they were eating while they were starving to death, they were eating the backs off their shields. They were eating their boots. They were trading their clothes to Indians for food. They were almost naked. I mean, these are the soldiers trying to make it up to Kusa. The other, it was a horrible experience. And, and I realized they ate that horse down to the horseshoes. <laughs> Literally, I think that's what happened. You know, they didn't, I, I mean, these are terrible things, but that's what was going on. They were really starving to death on this expedition. And these horse hooves, you know, if they're eating a, a sat, they're eating saddles off the horses, boiling them. And the, we certainly must have done that with a horse hoof. You know, you could have eaten that. I mean, it's, it's really grim. But remember, this is an apocalypse, and this is an apocalyptic moment of something that's happened to these Spanish. They have interjected themselves in the middle of an apocalypse. Well, those Indians didn't have a lot of food themselves. And they didn't want to have to feed these Spanish. There wasn't enough food and that much food to go around. So the Spanish were, were having to eat whatever they could get their hands on, and that's part of what they were doing. Again, they were back here at Etowah as well in the same time period. How about that? A little piece of gold. It's the only gold I've ever seen anywhere in the southeast. This was found on the leak site just down the highway here. Uh, while you know we had students troweling away in there, about 1991-92 on, on a thing that my organization helped, helped fund. And boom, this little piece popped up, about that big. And the first thing a student did was almost throw it away. Oh, look, looks like part of a tie class. Whoa, don't throw that away. <laughs> don't throw that away. Don't throw that away. This is little enameled hole. This is where little enameled pieces uh, would sit on top of this rivet. This is a copper backing back here, and it turns and goes around the corner. This is a piece of inlay for a box, a box, maybe a religious box of some kind, but a nice box because it was gold on top of that copper. So pretty important, pretty important piece there. Uh, we don't know which expedition it could have come off of. Could have come off of either one, the Luna or the Soto expedition. We're not sure. And then this remarkable thing that you've heard me talk about, some of you have, before, so I won't, there's a whole two hour lecture on that and we won't do that tonight. But I will tell you the brief version of this. This is a piece of copper that came off that site where the points came from, that site on the Kusawati that was a big site. And I had these characters, one of these characters call me up one day. And this was back before, we, we passed some laws, some good laws in Georgia to stop the looting of these burials, you know, to stop this activity. The, the Indians in Georgia were very upset they were desecrating burials. There were people out there. All they wanted to do was probe in there, find a burial, get down there, find artifacts, and who cares about the bones? You know, just shovel that stuff out on the ground. I mean, there's a lot of that that was going on before 1990, 91. Uh, and, and so, and we couldn't do anything to stop it. There really wasn't, there weren't any laws that prohibited people from doing that. But we passed some new laws, 1991, 92. I wrote the laws. I did it with Indian groups together. We got together. We passed a series of really good laws. That, that lay out lots of things. Like, what do you do if you're going to move a family cemetery because they want to put in a, a new subdivision? Well, you got to have a good structure about that. You know, who do you go to? How do you get permission to make that happen? We did that. We wrote that out too. But we also said, hey, you can't go in there and dig up Indian burials, and you can't be buying and selling artifacts that come out of burials. You know, we started, we, so we started shutting that down. But before that, I get this phone call from this guy. Hey, some guy in South Carolina, he's got found this thing down there and it's over in South Carolina. He paid $500 for it to somebody else and they dug this thing up and it was in a burial. And Okay, well, tell me more about it. Well, it's a piece of copper. It's got mud all over it. Okay, so I, give me the phone number. I call the guy in South Carolina. Yeah, I got that thing. Uh, you know, it's got some kind of picture on it. It's got little engraving kind of things on it engraved. I'll show you a cleaned up version in a minute. You know, and it's got little holes on either end. And it's got some other little things. It's got a couple of holes in the middle. You know, I don't know what that thing is. I said, well, listen, I'd really like to see that. Uh, you know, how about if I, you come to Atlanta one day and you can show it to me? Yeah, that'd be great. Four days later, it showed up in the mail. The guy packed it up in a box and just sent it to me. Oh, my gosh. So I had it for six months, and I worked with it under a microscope for six months, cleaning it, figuring out what it was, doing x-rays of it before I cleaned it. I mean, it was, it was a long experience, and it was terrific. Well, after the cleaning, this is what was underneath. Now, 
Okay. Now, I had that clean, and I was looking at that picture, and I'm still wondering, what in the hell is this? You know, what do these figures represent? And I spent another three or four months digging into diaries from Mexico, looking at, at materials from Mexico from the 16th century, all kinds of things, and we figured it out. This is, I'm giving you the short version, the announcement of the birth of Christ to Mary by the angel Gabriel. This is representing Mary. This is representing Gabriel. This is representing an ox, split hoof, downturn horn. In the, the story of the announcement of the birth of Christ is in the book of Luke. Luke is represented by an ox in many texts, and especially in 16th century iconography. Uh, you know, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are represented by different animals. Luke is represented by an ox. This is the ox telling the story. In the story, the angel gives Mary instruction. In Aztec, this is done in Aztec clothing styles, by the way. This is called a huipili, a stamp neck design, a long skirt. This is, called, this is a cloak that only with the knot tied at the neck in the front, only certain people were allowed to do that. If you were a common person, your cloak is tied in the back. As you gain status, it moves to the front. If you're a messenger, it can be in the front. And that's what that means, that cloak being knotted there in the neck. He is presenting a flower to her, a rose. It looks oversized, but it's meant to be to display more of what that is. In Aztec life, this is giving instruction. We think it's the other way around. This is receiving instruction. It's opposite from what we would think, but that's the way it is in Aztec life. This represents flowers over the shoulder, like uh, lilies, types of lilies. Uh, that you see in 16th century iconography in Europe. This is this setup with the angel on this side, Mary on this side, that setup between those two. It's in every single church you go in, in anywhere in Italy or Spain during, that, that were made between 15th, 16th, 17th century. You've got, you've got different scenes of the life of Christ, and the first one is the Annunciation scene, the announcement of the birth of Christ to Mary. An annunciation, that's what this is. An annunciation scene in Aztec clothing style. I mean, again, I'm giving you the five-minute version instead of the, the two-hour version of how we figured all this out. This was the cover to a Bible or a book of some kind. These little nail holes over here, it's what nailed it down. These two little holes in the middle were after it was ripped off of that. Some Indian took it here locally, drilled two little holes in it, and wore it around the neck like a gorget. And they're little decorative pieces around the sides, and it was buried in the hand of a 13-year-old child up against their face. We know that because of the teeth that were found uh, with it at the same time. So it's a pretty fascinating piece. I mean, I, and I've got a, uh, a picture of it over here if you want to see it afterwards, but this is a color picture of what it looked like after we cleaned it up, and it's a pretty spectacular piece. Some people have called that the most important artifact ever found in Georgia because of the story that it tells. 16th century iconography interpreted by an Aztec Indian, made by an Aztec Indian in a shop, probably under the supervision of a Catholic priest in Mexico City, put on the cover of a book or Bible, brought to northwest Georgia, probably used as an educational piece. They did a lot of that with pictures at the time. And buried with a child in northwest Georgia at the time. Oh my gosh, talk about all the cross currents of information going on in that one piece. Yes? What's that? You can date that to 1560, no question. 1559, 1560, you know, there's even some enameling, we think, on the back. They did something in the same period called Limoges, where they made copper plates like this in Europe, in France in particular, and then in Spain, they took manganese over the top, rubbed it on the top, uh, fired it, and it came out in different uh, whites, different whites and grays. The back side of this is so hard we can't even scratch it, so it's some kind of enameling on the back. Yeah. Oh, it came on that DeLuna expedition. We firmly believe that. Oh, yeah. Firmly believe that. Hey, this is an annunciation scene, right? You remember the name of the priest on the expedition? Domingo de la Annunciación. And he was the guy who was so fluent in all these different languages. I think it was a student of his who, you know, who, who uh, saw this. This is an up-close picture of one of the characters. That is, look at that picture. 
That is made by a 16th century Indian. That is a, a, a little diagram done by a 16th century Indian in, Mes in, Ax in Aztec in Mexico. It's something called the Sahagun documents of that same period. Same cloak, there it's tied in the back, same hairdo. Uh, this is a gold worker. But that's what I did. I went through that. Oh, I forgot. I left that one detail for you. Guess what that, look at that. Every single mark in here is very intentionally made. It's cut with an obsidian blade over and over and over. There are no mistakes on any of those little details. That little detail, I went through 23 volumes of text, of pictures from the Sahagun documents from the 16th century in Mexico. There's only two references to something like that. That represents a torn and mended skirt. A torn and mended skirt. That is to show a woman of more modest character. More modest character. Luke calls, tells Mary that she is the handmaiden of the Lord. So this is meant to represent that. that she is of modest character. That's what that torn and mended skirt's all about. So there are fascinating details in this, in this thing. Uh, that's what a Limoges, a French Bible cover, looks like from the same time period. Again, copper overlaid with manganese. So we think that's what it, that's what it was. Uh, yes? Yes, they had Aztecs on this expedition too. And were they um, respected as equal or were they servants? Or what were yeah, they had a variety of them. Some of them, were, uh, some of them were servants, some of them were acting as interpreters, although they couldn't interpret this language, but they were acting in various roles. They've even found some of the little uh, obsidian blades down in Pensacola that came off the expedition that were, were types that Aztec Indians were using in Mexico at the same time period. So they were acting in different roles. I want to show you the rest of this and try to close it down a little bit. Uh, this is the rest of the Deluna expedition, meaning it wasn't over. You know, they came in, got somebody else to head up the expedition from there on, and tried to go on to Santa Elena. The king really wanted that to happen. So the remnants of that expedition actually went on and did some of this. Most of the expedition made it back to Mexico City, including that priest, Domingo de la Anunciación, who lived to be about 90 years old and got a lot of biography material on him and all of his, all his original letters and things, we might still find in Mexico City. But there was a biography about him written where a lot of this information comes from out of his, out of his stuff. And that's what all this documentation stuff's all about. John Wirth's done a lot of this recently. Uh, John's been digging in. He's been in Havana, Cuba. He's been everywhere digging and finding more of these documents as he, as he goes. This is some of the material that they found in Pensacola. Uh, recently, just in the past three years, they found the village. They found the village, older than St. Augustine. It's now documented as the oldest settlement uh, in North America. You know, uh, oldest one, uh, sorry, in this part of North America. And a lot of different materials here, different kinds of Spanish olive jar, other materials, wired nails. Look at the beads up there. I'm going to get a close-up on these little pieces of uh, lead shot. There are the beads. Wow, they look just like the ones from northwest Georgia, don't they? They're the northwest Georgia ones. They're the ones they found down there. Almost identical. Even the little dark blue thing from there. So John's looking at those as well. Uh, pieces of Spanish helmets, little rivets off of those. Remember the crossbow bolts? These were crossbow bolts found in Pensacola. There's the one found in northwest Georgia. Almost, almost identical stuff. Same things. Pieces of chain mail off of vests of armaments that they had. Weights. Uh, this is the way these villages, this is the way these concentrations of political units looked like in the 16th century. Now, all of those collapsed. This one here in northwest Georgia, this one over in Rome, all these disappeared. They all moved downriver. So that all of northwest Georgia was then abandoned by 1600. Nobody was here. It was all abandoned. Cherokees started coming in in the 1750s and started moving out. This is how people started moving, moving down river, 1600 to 1650. A lot of movement of these Indian groups, banding together. 1675 to 1700, even more movement. More movement than I could even draw green arrows on. You know, just crazy things. And even more in the 1700, 1735. Just small groups. 90% of these people had disappeared. 90% of these populations were wiped out. 95%. So you got the little groups that are left are little refugee groups. Little refugee groups. That's who's moving around. And they're all moving around because they're getting displaced by some other group. Or Europeans or somebody else is threatening them all the time. Remember, it's just like an apocalypse. 
They're looking for food. They're trying to get transportation to band together. They're looking for their friends. They're trying to survive, truly survival. And that's what that is showing. And then the English come in on top of that, and they start paying one group of Indians to go after others to enslave them. Oh, my gosh. I mean, so everything horrible happens to these people after 1600. It just continues to get worse and worse. Then finally, things kind of settle down. The people who occupied the Cherokees that occupied northwest Georgia, they were refugees. They'd been knocked out of Tennessee and North Carolina. They came into northwest Georgia because nobody else was here. It was, it was vacant in the 1700s, 1750. And that's, they established their headquarters, their capital on the same river, same place where Kusa had been. Well, Kusawati, Kusawati means old place of Kusa in Cherokee. So the Cherokees knew that was the old place of Kusa. They knew that's where the creeks had been, and they had moved into that same, that same land and that same territory. 